What Everybody Wednesday is back, and that means it's time for another installment of the What Everybody Podcast. What an episode we have for you this week and next week. That's right, we have today the first of a two-part interview with Michael Goldberg. Who is Michael Goldberg, you might ask? Let me tell you. He's a music journalist, a former Rolling Stone magazine editor, one of the first to do an online music magazine, and he's a writer. And that's why he's here with us today to talk about his new book, Wicked Game, the true story of guitarist James Calvin Wilsey. So basically, Michael is a complete badass and an all-around interesting fella. So sit back, grab a cold one, and with no further ado, Ryan and Johnny. Buddy. Hi, hello, buddy. How you doing? Welcome. Welcome back to, to episode another. fifty-three. Welcome to episode fifty-three. Fluffy three, fluffy yeah. three, fluffy. I don't. Know, I've been saying that the last couple of weeks. I like it. It's fun. It's catchy to me. Yeah. Well, you know, you're a catchy kind of fucking guy. Yeah. yeah maybe What's get new? The, this microphone out of my fucking face. What's new? Yeah. What's new? Well, Give me good my, news. Give me good news. After they, you say hi to the got, people. I remember. Say hi to the people. Hi to the people. Hello, hello, hello. Well, episode hello, 53. Hello. We, ha- we actually have a cool episode today there, uh, Harris. I'm pretty excited about that. Actually. Good, good, uh, real quick. Good news. You want a good news? I got my sandwich right this morning. All right. Now on to, on to hey. pass the good news. Um, <laughs> so we have a cool episode today. Yeah. Very cool episode. We have a former editor from Rolling Stone magazine. We have a guy who started the first music news website back in the 90s we have a guy addicted to noise we've got a guy who not only was an editor but also a writer for rolling stone but now he writes books we're gonna talk about his book and his name is michael goldberg i was gonna say you know i didn't want to cut you off but you made it sound like we have like 15 people on today we have one guest on today he was he's been a writer he's been a you know an editor he's now he's a novelist it's pretty cool yeah he was an editor fucking from 83 to 93 for rolling yeah. stone a very interesting time in music and in the world time. yeah yeah is a, you know it was a very greedy time in the world it was a well, very a, neon time in the world you know here's the thing he was there for 10 years and i think if you're at a place like rolling stone for 10 years you're gonna see some change in music it went from you know the glam of the 80s into the grunge of the 90s it's like a cool transition that that, that is an interesting Excuse me. Transition. transitional time also i was a child so it's probably more appealing to me because that was like the time i was growing up you know <coughs> whatever buddy whatever buddy whatever buddy it's a wednesday morning thursday yeah. morning <laughs> so i'm gonna shoot him a link it is it is it we are we are <laughs> on time today we are on time today and it makes me happy both of us mm. Two yeah. dickheads that can't be on time ever, and we're both on time today. <coughs> we're on time today. Are you done? Are you done coughing? <coughs> yeah. Okay, we got Michael. We got Michael. Hopefully connecting. Hey, Michael. Hey. What's hey. up? How you doing, man? Hey. Hey, hey, Michael. I'm Johnny, by the way. Nice to meet you. And I'm Ryan. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, nice to meet you, Johnny, and nice to meet you, Ryan. Actually, I'd like this to be a. Via this, via t- yeah, via via messenger, where we go way back, but uh, in person, it's nice to meet you. So, for for those uh, out there listening, this is Michael Goldberg. Michael has got uh, an extensive history of great, cool stuff that he's done. Uh, he's been an editor for Rolling Stone magazine. He's been a writer for Rolling Stone magazine. You've written books. You're you're uh, you're an animal uh, activist. You do all this really cool stuff. So, uh, for those out there, we're gonna we're gonna dive into this. We're gonna try to get deep into it and, and learn as much as we possibly can because. I've got questions out the Yahoo that I can ask you. I'm, <laughs> I'm dying to know. So you uh, you were looking up some podcasts. I have a feeling you're kind of like an internet savvy guy, because you started a <laughs> website called Addicted to Noise that ended up being like one of the first online like web sources for music news. And, yeah, I, I uh, mean, it wasn't just the first um, music. Uh, website or, or yeah. music magazine web music magazine but it was the second web magazine period i mean there was there was nothing and then hotwired went live somewhere like october or the end of november somewhere in there uh of what 94 year was that? 94 and then wow. I, lo- I launched wow. addicted to noise december 1st of 94 so we were really there 
in the early days. And what yeah. was exciting about that, I mean, it was exciting right off the bat because you were getting people coming in from all over the world. And that was yeah. just a crazy thing. I mean, to imagine that, I mean, this thing was like, I mean, I was working out of like a spare room of my house. Yeah. And then there was these guys who were in Santa Cruz who were handling the tech end of it. And so, you know, here, here I am, you know, posting things, you know, from, you know, from my house and they're being read all over the world and yeah. really- and Which is a crazy concept at the time because it was like right in the beginning. I mean, like real quick, I, I need wild, to rewind a little it. bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because like uh, coming out of that, going into that, like w what made you think to yourself, like now you, you just came out of Rolling Stone, right? At, around 93, if I'm correct. What made you go, we're going this way. This is definitely the next thing and I wanna be in front of everybody. Basically, I mean, what, what happened was, um, I was on America Online and I was observing sort of what was going on and there were like record companies uh, were creating, uh, I don't know, these like spaces where people who are into a particular band on their label could chat back and forth. And, mm -hmm. you know, just observing this, I thought, well, this, this would be a great format for a magazine. Why can't we do like a, a magazine here? And so I, I just started thinking about it and, and sort of developing what it could be. And then I was researching a story about the future of digital music or just the future of music period, really. And met some guys who were doing a, basically they were doing an underground music website. They were the first ones. And they were putting up um, pages for bands that no one had ever heard of, completely uns unsigned, the most local bands there were. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is way cooler than AOL. I mean, that's yeah. ridiculous compared to this. Yeah. And so anyway, um, I immediately realized this is going to be the medium. And I could see that this was, I mean, it, it, it just was like, it. I, did, I don't know, it was just like, as soon as I it started experiencing these things, it was like, okay, this is the way to go. This is how things are going to go. Yeah. So now's the time to get in and do it um, because, and, and it wasn't like, I wasn't looking at it um, the way people look at this stuff now. It's like, you know, where do I get funding? Where do, I mean, to like, to do this huge, huge corporate thing. That's not how I, I looked at addicted to noise. Um, I looked at it as like, this was a way to like write about the stuff that and cover the stuff that I really cared about and have it reach people all over the world. And I had this idea that bands that were fairly obscure, if you were drawing from the whole world, there would be pockets of fans here, there and everywhere. And together you would have mm -hmm. enough people for that particular band to make it viable. You know, to it's be very, it's, it's so ahead of oh, its yeah. time. Uh, you, well, yeah, you like, I was just going to say, and it's like obvious, but this is thirty years ago. Yeah, we we read about this. I, it, you explaining it, I just had this like overwhelming feeling of like you were a pioneer in like like one hundred percent internet like internet magazines, music. Like, I mean, it's crazy. I can't even fucking wrap my mind around it when I think about it. It's kind of like <laughs> well, blowing my fucking mind for a second. Well, uh, do you guys remember Salon? Salon Magazine? It was like a big general interest online magazine. Well, I, I mean, it was, it, it ended up being huge, but it probably folded 10 years ago or 50, you know, I mean, it's, it's been, a, this has all been a while now, you know, but yeah. well, I thought you guys might know that because that magazine, the guy who, who started that, he got to, I knew him and he got together with me to pick my brain before he started this thing that ultimately became huge. I mean, if you do, if you, um, if you Google salon, David Talbot, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. I mean, it was, yeah. a, it was a big deal, but yeah, no, I was, I was at the beginning and um, I'm proud of the fact that I, you know, had the insight to, to figure it out 
so early on, like where this where this was all going. Yeah, you should be. You made mention in your book. We'll get to your book. We'll I'll definitely get to your book, Wicked Game. But like the man that you're speaking of in the book used to go to the record stores and he was like he like sought out unknown bands and like tried to find all the music and everything. And it's like it just I thought of that because it's like you've thought of another way to get it out to people. Well, you know, right from the start when all our record reviews and all our features and interviews included sound samples from the albums. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when we ran a, a review of whatever Sonic youth or, you know, whoever it was, there would be three or four 45 second sound samples embedded in the review. Now yeah. at that point in time, hardly anyone had the bandwidth to actually be able to listen to that. But if you <laughs> did have the bandwidth, it was really cool because, you know, you're reading a review of, uh, you know, a, a band you've never heard of before, but yeah. now you can listen, to, you can actually listen while you're reading. So it's, it's, it's suddenly not just that thing of taking the writer's word. You can decide for yourself, well, does this sound cool to me or not? So this was yeah. all stuff that like I thought was like really cool back then and had not been done before. And we were just trying to figure out. And, and it was, and there were other, there were people who were really smart people who were working with me, and we were just trying to figure out how, you know, how can we do this? What can, what can we do that will, will be really great? And, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, because pretty quick, it, you know, it, it's not obviously when you're online, it's not just print, you know, sure yeah. you got, you got print, but you got audio, you got photographs, you know, after a while we had video. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, anyway, I remember was, when like ba back then when the internet was first getting started, though, like just to be able to see a picture on the screen, I was amazed by it. Like it would amazing. come up, I'm like, wow, yeah. there's a picture. Well, let, let's rewind yeah. a little bit. Like, yeah. I'm really fascinated at the fact that you were an, also an editor and a writer for for Rolling Stone, which is fascinating to me. And then you went on and you did the the website, which is basically <clears throat> also news and stories and writing. What first, I'd love to know just to, to get an idea of where you come from. When you're looking to write a story or a piece or a book or whatever it is, what is it that you're looking for in a story that makes you say, I want to write about that, whether it's a band, a person, uh, whatever, maybe? Well, first of all, I wanted to write about, I always want to write about music. I mean, when I was a teenager, the first issue of Rolling Stone was published and I, I read the first issues like standing in a, in a store. And then the second issue I bought. And after that, I bought every issue, you know, going forward. And I decided pretty quick. Well, I mean, I was in high school. I decided this is what I want to do. You know, I mean, I had always liked to write. I had been really good as a writer, you know, in, in school. And uh, so I thought this is going to this is cool because you, you get to hang out with the artists and you get to see what their world is like. And then you get to put that down. You went to high school in the West Coast, just to try to get a little bit of background there. West uh, yeah, Coast I went guy. to high school at, at Tamil Pius High School in Mill Valley, California, which was a really, Mill Valley was a really cool, cool kind of small town in, in uh, Marin County back then. I mean, musicians would just be, you'd be the downtown Mill Valley and there's Marty Ballin from the Jefferson Airplane just walking <laughs> down the street. And, you know, Michael Bloomfield, who I don't know if you know who he was, but Michael Bloomfield in the 60s, he, he played on Bob Dylan's Highway 61 and Revisited. He was I like, love that album. He, he's, he's considered one of the great blues guitarists. Again, if you look him up, you'll, you'll see. He just lived a couple of blocks away from downtown Mill Valley. We went, me and my friend went to his house, knocked on his door, said, hey, we're big fans. You know, he says, hey, come in, come on in, you guys. And then we, we were able to just hang out and like ask him questions about Bob Dylan and his his yeah. playing and ever, you know, that's the kind of place Mill Valley was. And in terms of uh, what I was looking for to, when I was writing about things, it usually came down when it was a musician to, you know, was it somebody that I was interested in their music? I mean, if I if I was interested in their music, then. I would interview them and I would find this, you would find the story by talking to them. I mean, sometimes you know the story beforehand. I mean, if it's a, if it's a new story, if something has happened, I mean, I did a cover story for Rolling Stone on James Brown and I did it after he was arrested for, you know, he was smoking angel dust and he went into, you know, he went into a, <laughs> went, went into a classroom with a shotgun and, and was threatening people. And then there was like a multi-state craze, I mean, state chase. So that's a situation where 
you know, did he go to jail of, for that? That's a crazy yeah, he did. fucking he actually, story. He actually did. Yeah. yeah he um, lost but, it. um, you know, so there's situ at times when, when the story, story is obvious, but a, a lot of times when you're doing profiles of, um, of bands, it's, it really starts from, you know, is the music good or, you know, with Rolling Stone, I mean, sometimes like with new bands, like with, I mean, I wrote about Chris Isaac's band. It, originally, the band was Silvertone, and it Silver wasn't Tone. just Chris Isaac. I mean, it wasn't thought of as Chris Isaac's band. It was thought of as a band, and there were two guys, Jimmy Wilsey, who I wrote my book about, and Chris Isaac, who founded it. Well, I wrote the first story that showed up in Rolling Stone when their, when their debut album came out, um, or the Counting Crows. Like, right when their first album came out, I, I had a story out in Rolling Stone about them. That was always a cool thing if you could basically write about a band that had pretty much not been written about much other than at the local level. Mm -hmm. um, but but other times it would be, you know, I mean, it's like I'd get an assignment, you know, we, we want a story on Lindsey Buckingham, you know, go spend a few days with Lindsey Buckingham and, you know, give us 3000 words. And so then that's that's what I would do, you know, and I didn't always I didn't look at it like I had to be a fan of the artist, although I was a fan of of Lindsey Buckingham, but I didn't have to have been. I, I always looked at it like I'm going to write the best story I can possibly write about this artist or this band. On your assignments, what would happen in a scenario where you're like, I fucking hate this band and I got to go spend how many days with this guy? That's going to kill me. That ever happened. <laughs> um, I did a story about the Scorpions. Uh -huh. They're they're like a they're like 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 a horrible metal band from <laughs> Germany. Maybe, yeah, I think Germany. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, Germany. I mean, there was nothing about their music <laughs> that I had any interest in at all. Um, but the thing was, just hanging out with them, they were like Spinal Tap. <laughs> I mean, they really were. <laughs> I mean, all I had to do was describe the stuff that happened, and it was hilarious. And so, it it was it it was a really funny story. It wasn't like I had to make fun of them or anything. All I Just had to do was, you know, yeah. or or I had to another band I I really didn't like was Loverboy, and I had to do a, a story on on them. But but also, I mean, it just, I mean, sometimes with these bands, I mean, you just watch and take notes on on just what goes down. And, um, yeah. and the thing and the things they say, especially that time period too, because that was sort of like the the debaucherous, if that's even a word, time of rock and roll, where was, you could just tell the truth, and the parody would come out in that. Yeah, I mean, but you know, they were also, I mean, like like I was able to convince, um, you know, my editor that um, this was this was punk had happened. But now we were into what I called, what I thought of as post-punk. And this was the second wave. This was like Black Flag and, and The Replacements and Husker mm -hmm. Du and The Minutemen and Flipper. And so I was able to convince my editor that uh, we needed to do a trend piece about this, this new wave, you know, that was happening. And he went for it. And so I was able to write the first extensive story th about those bands is that what got you into following the avengers and eventually uh getting into that scene of things well, well that was that was earlier i mean mm -hmm. yeah, the, yeah. the the avengers was um they formed in 1977 the the, mm -hmm. the the punks basically what happened was the punk scene as we punk as we know it started in new york you know it really around 75 is 74 75 that's when bands like television the ramones talking heads Mink DeVille, Patti Smith, all those bands were happening in New York. They were all playing CBGBs. So that happened. And I'm reading about all that in the Village Voice. I have a subscription. I'm out in here, I'm out in San Francisco, but I got a subscription to the Village Voice just so yeah. I could read about what was going on there. And so and then so when those bands would come out to the Bay Area for the first time, then you could actually hear what they they sounded like. Okay. So yeah. so that happens. And then, you know. They start going to Europe. The Ramones goes to England. All these people see the Ramones and they start the Sex Pistols and the Clash and, you know, the English bands. And then the English band, the thing explodes when the Sex Pistols, you know, go on, you know, go on TV. And then meanwhile, so then it's in San Francisco, musicians who had been observing the New York thing and and then reading about what's happening in London, 
they started started bands. And so San Francisco's punk scene, the first the first really punk show happened at this place called the Mabue Gardens, which became the ground zero club for punk. It was the only punk for club for punk for quite a while in the city. And that's where um, that's where everything started in December of, ni- of mm-hmm. 1976. Jimmy Wilsey came out in August of 76. So he's he's right in the right place when it all right starts place, right in San Francisco. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I mean, I was always checking out what's going on, what's the new thing going on, and really quickly I was hearing about crime and the nuns, and and so uh, so I went to the Babuay Gardens and saw crime and uh, ended up doing a doing a. I didn't get it at first. Did a story um, though about um, sort of this new scene that was happening in San Francisco, and um, and then the Avengers formed in June of 77 and you know I saw them at at some point at probably toward the you know some point in that that year I saw them um I definitely saw them open for the Sex Pistols in January of 78 and took that photographs was the Wal- that was the Waldorf show is it was it Waldorf that they played no no that was Winterland when they opened for the oh, Sex my, Pistols yeah, my, my okay. Winterland yeah. it was a it was a former ice rink that it actually it was sometimes used as an ice rink, but it was a 5,000 capacity, huge venue where, where groups, I mean, David Bowie played, he did his Ziggy Stardust yeah. tour, he played there, the Doors played there, um, the Stones. I mean, it, it, that was a big, fairly big sized place. And that's where the Sex Pistols played. It was completely sold out. It was insane. But anyway, the Avengers, you know, opened, a lot of people, who actually saw the show think the Avengers were better than the Sex Pistols? You know, I th- I was a f- fan of the se- of uh, the Aven- I was a fan of the Sex Pistols, but I was also a fan of the Avengers. There were there were a lot of good San Francisco punk bands that never got the sort of recognition that they really should have. What was the biggest punk band to come out of that scene, if any? Uh, probably the Dead Kennedys. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I mean, maybe I mean, in terms of lasting, um, Flipper in the sense that, I mean, Flipper is still performing. And because, you know, Kurt Cobain was a fan, Chris Novoselic was a fan, you know, I mean, Kurt Cobain went on Saturday Night Live, he wore a t-shirt, handmade, hand-drawn t-shirt that, that was like the Flipper logo and said Flipper on it. Who were you writing for at, at that time? You said that you were at that show to report about, who were you writing for? Um, in 78, I was writing for I do st- a bunch of places. I, I was freelance writing. I freelance. wrote for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. I wrote for the Berkeley Barb. Um, I wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle Sunday Entertainment section. You could do feature stories on bands that were coming to town. I did a lot, a lot of stories, uh, you know, f- for the Chronicle. I, I did stuff sometimes for the San Francisco Examiner, which was a which the other big daily newspaper at the time. And then I started getting things into you know, magazines like Cream. Um, I wrote about Devo when when their first album came out for a magazine, a national magazine at the time called New Times. It was a really cool, slick magazine. Um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, Downbeat. I, I ended up writing for Downbeat. I ended up, I mean, it just sort of was a progressive thing as time went on. I mean, first, until I got hired by Rolling Stone. And then that was, yeah. That, then that was full, you know, my full time gig was Rolling Stones. Wait, that'll bring us full circle to the thing you were about to bring up that I, I, I brought you back off the ledge from, which was the, the stuff you wrote about the mob. Because I, I have a question about that. A, I'm dying to know that because I haven't read the article, um, but it's really curious. But writing about the mob, I always see people, you know, if they're talking about the mob on TV or something along that, I'm always thinking to myself, do these guys ever get a little freaked out? Now the mob knows who they are and knows they're out there talking about them. Is it anything that makes you go, well, that's a little fucking freaky? Well, yeah. And I'll tell you <laughs> what happened that, that, that really freaked me out is um, one day, um, this was, uh, I was, we lived in San Francisco at the time and we, in this house, it was a three story house and uh, our bedroom was on the third floor. And I hear something out in the street and I look out the window and there's a vehicle that's like parked next to, it's like there's, you know, the curb and then there's cars, my car is a curb. And then it's just out there with the engine running, I guess this is this other vehicle. And there's these guys and they have laid a big tarp down on the ground and they are emptying 
because the garbage, it was the day the garbage was going to get picked up. They are, <laughs> they have poured the entire contents of our garbage can on this tarp and then they pull it take up it and tie it, put it in their vehicle and take off. And I, I just knew that had to be, they had to be working for, you know, someone that I was writing about and yeah. they were hoping that they were going to find something in there. God, God knows what they thought they were going to find in my, in find my notes or I mean, who knows what they thought they were going to find. That freaked me out. That question, what's the connection with mob and, and the music? How, well, how did that go? What, what happened was, um, God, this is so long ago. There was a record company that um, hired a guy who was connected to, um, you know, sort of the, essentially we could say he was just connected to one of the crime groups. He knew a guy that knows a guy. He, <laughs> no, I mean, well, he was connected. I mean, it was, it was like he was involved in stuff. And so yeah. there was a whole bunch of fishy stuff that were going on between this record what company. Re what, the record, time. what record company it, was it? it? It was MCA records, which okay, is, yeah. is, you know, it has subsequently been absorbed by, you know, it's a whole yeah. different situation. But right. at that particular point in time, this, this guy who had no real qualifications to be working at the record company had been brought in and he was involved in, I mean, I can't remember the details now. I'd have to go back. It's so long yeah. ago. I mean, we're talking yeah. decades and decades and decades ago, but there was a government investigation going on and I had sources that I was able to get information from, you know, as their, as this um, investigation was progressing. And um, so I was, I did a whole series of stories for Rolling Stone on what was going on between this record company and, you know, this this uh, crime situation and um that yeah freak me out dude we're, we're, okay so like knowing being that you got freaked out was this like one of those things like you know what this could be like one of those articles i write that's just like could help the career a whole bunch that it's worth putting myself in the uh i don't know direct uh they know who you are i don't yeah I, you know uh, is it crossfire i don't know if it's crossfire it's it's, it's uh, cross that's a little bit dramatic but yeah. it's getting towards that yeah. region yeah, yeah i just felt like i mean i wasn't the only person in the world who was writing about this there was a guy um and the la times who was also um writing about some of this stuff yeah. and so i felt like well if we go down we go down together <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, it was only when that whole thing with the garbage can, you know, happened that I did. I did get freaked. Oh my gosh, it did. This is real now. Now they you know, know how to find me. <laughs> yeah. There was also I did a whole bunch of stuff about um, payola back then because yeah. Um, yeah. because that was happening. And um, there were these indie what they called indie record promoters. They were independent guys that the, the record companies wanted to shield themselves from from getting um, investigated or getting, you know, from they wanted to use do payola, but they didn't want to be able to get caught doing payola. So what they did was, you know, back in the fifties, they would just, you know, you know, record company, you know, so the guy doing promotion for the record company, you know, would just literally go and pay a DJ some money yeah. to put a record on the air. You know, that wasn't illegal initially. And then it became made illegal to where you could pay somebody, but you had to make it public. Nobody wants to like, you know, oh, this record is only on the air because this record company is paying the radio station to play it. Yeah, you know, right. basically as time went on, by the time I was reporting on this, which is the 80s now, um, what was going on then was the record company would hire and it was, you know, an independent promotion man or company. And so then they were paying these guys to promote their records. They don't know how the records are getting promoted. I mean, they, yeah. you know, they, they just hire this guy and say, do everything you can to get it on the radio. But, you know, don't do anything illegal. You know, well, right, right, right. Um, but then, but were, then their hands, their hands are off of it. And it's then they're those then those okay. indie guys are doing whatever they need to do, which was, you know, paying money, letting people, you know, taking music directors on trips to, you know, Italy or, you know, all kinds, you know, all that stuff, hookers, drugs, you know, the whole, whole yeah. gamut. Well, then it, it moved on to another stage, which was even better for the record companies because they really, this really distanced them. They would give promotion money to the manager of a band 
And then the manager of the band would hire the independent promotion company. And then the independent promotion company would, would you know, do the payola. So now you had two layers of separation. Uh, and there was a time, you know, and I, I mentioned this in, the, in my book, there was a time when you pretty much could not get a record played on the radio if this wasn't happening. Of course, nowadays, I mean, the internet has become so much more important, um, or maybe, I don't know if it's more important, but it's certainly become a big, a huge factor, you know, in per people finding out about music and new new music and, and all. Yeah. And obviously the, with the streaming services, people, you know, a lot of people, you know, you don't need to listen to radio. Why do you need to listen to radio when you can listen to everything you want, you right. know, on a, on a streaming service? Back, so like, but in 83, you started at Rolling Stone. Um, and it's weird. Now, James Cameron, that's the guy, the almost famous guy, right? Uh, who wrote Almost Famous, and he was like a Rolling Stone article. He was a Rolling Stone writer. No, no, no. It's um, Cameron Crowe. Cameron Crowe. That's Cameron, it. Cameron Crowe. Uh, that's it. Um, who, who's James Cameron? He's a, uh, what a, who gives a fuck? Um, he's a, movie, he's a so, movie director. He's a director. <laughs> he's a movie director. Okay, that's it. I was following um, you. <laughs> so, so, so uh, you, it seems like you guys were there around the same time, or was he before you? Because your story sounds kind of similar to like his story, where like that's what he wanted to do, and then he got in, you know, Rolling Stone eventually, and it sounds like that's how you know a thing that you he, always he, tried. He, to. he was he was earlier than me. He was earlier, and you know, he was I think fifteen years old or sixteen years old when he started writing yeah. for, oh, wow. for for Cream and Rolling Stone. Yeah, he was really really young, you know, really young, really smart. Um, but, but, you know, the thing that was funny is, you know, in that movie, you know, there's that whole thing where he gets a hold of Lester Bangs and Lester yeah. Bangs sort of mentors him. And when I was 17, I guess, I mean, I wrote a letter to, to Lester Bangs at Cream Magazine and I said, hey, can I write record reviews for you? Yeah. <laughs> and he, and he, he wrote me back. I couldn't believe it. He yeah. writes me back this letter and he says, We'll send some reviews and we'll see, you know, so I so I did. I sent him some reviews. But I mean, I was in high school. I, I couldn't write a, a review that was good enough for Cream Magazine when I was you know, when I was 17. You know, yeah. so I sent him these reviews, but, you know, they didn't fly. You know, later I did write for Cream Magazine, but, you know, the, Lester was gone by then. But it was that's the kind of guy he was. I mean, he was that accessible. That's amazing, though, because that got that got you in into that process at the age of 17 and maybe your articles weren't good enough at the age of 17 but it got you writing and it got you you know working on what's your what's cool about that is the time because back then i was a little kid back in the 80s i was in like elementary intermediate school and uh i i've always been a musician that's what i do to this day but i've always also had the knack for the uh music business side of it so like i would be in like the seventh grade and i would just call up like a record company, I'd be like, a and r department. They'd be like, all right. They'd connect me through and they'd be like, A&R. And I'd be like, uh, click. You know what I mean? But, but like, you couldn't do that today. Like, there's no fucking chance you could even no. get through now, you know? Yeah. I hope we can talk a bit a bit about the Wilsey book because um, I've, I've spent the past, you know, three and a half years just, like, completely obsessed with, you know, getting his story down. Could you... Uh, Explain to me a little bit about when it comes to James. Uh, how do you know him? I was going to do a story about upcoming bands in the Bay Area. And so I was doing research to figure out because I wanted to write about four bands. And so, you know, everybody I knew, I would ask, you know, what's the best, you know, new bands that, you, that you've heard, you know. And this band Silvertone kept that name kept coming up and I heard a demo by them, and it was really, really great. So this, one of the songs was called Blue Hotel, mm -hmm. and it was rough, but it was fantastic. And so I went to, um, I decided I was gonna include them in the story, and I went to see them at a club called the Berkeley Square in Berkeley, and their set, they were great. They were just, it was fantastic. And- What, what year was this? This was 82. And, uh, They'd been together, you know, for about a year and maybe a year and a, in a few months at that point uh, in the incarnation that I saw. And um, when they were done, I met 
Eric Jacobson was there. Eric Jacobson was co-managing the band and he was their producer. Mm -hmm. Eric Jacobson produced seven top 10 hits for the Love and Spoonful in the mid 60s. He's a major guy. He discovered Tim Harden and produced Tim Harden's records. Bob Dylan has said that Tim Harden is the best songwriter there ever was. So, I mean, Eric Jacobson was a major guy. I had been a fan of Eric Jacobson since I was a teenager because I, I always would look at who was the producer, you know, on the records that I loved. So he took me backstage. We talked first, we, me and him talked about the band. And then he introduced me to the four guys, one of whom was Jimmy Wilsey. And so then after that, you know, during the rest of the 80s, I mean, I ended up writing more half a dozen or more stories. I mean, they would end up being stories about Chris Isaac because it stopped being Silvertone when the first album came out and it became Chris Isaac and Silvertone. But it, yeah. the focus was on Chris Isaac. You know, he's the front guy. He's the charismatic guy. He's the singer. He's the songwriter. Um, but I would always end up, you know, talking to Jimmy as well. And when I would go to gigs afterwards, if I was backstage, whatever, you know, I'd, I'd see Jimmy. So there was just a casual, we both know who each, each other is. And, you know, and then um, when Wicked Game happened, I did a big story for Rolling Stone and interviewed, uh, I had interviewed Wilsey previously um, in 87 for a story I was doing. Um, and then I interviewed him in 91 a couple of times, interviewed him for the Isaac story. And then now that they had a big hit, I was able to sell a story on on Jimmy to Guitar Player magazine. And so I profiled Jimmy for Guitar Player. Cool. And I also did a story on something that was really brand new that was happening at that point, which was turning your computer into a recording studio. Like, this seems like, well, what's the big deal? Everyone has, you know, garage band or what, you know, now what's no big yeah. deal. Well, this was unheard of. You couldn't do this back then, right? This is the very first program had come out. It was called Deck, and you could use Deck on a, on a Macintosh and you could record four separate tracks. Yeah. And then of course you could bounce tracks back and forth. So you could free up tracks. So yeah, anyway, yeah. Jim, Jimmy was one of the first guys to be using these programs. They actually used a, a program called Sound Tools on to, to get the edit of, of Wicked Game. But anyway, um, so I was going over to, I, I wrote a story for Rolling Stone about this new phenomena. There was no Pro Tools. This was, this was, a, this was just a brand new, this was the beginning of it. And so, I, and so I interviewed Jimmy for that. And, you know, we just got, became friends. And then I would go over to his place and he would, you know, show me what he was working on because he was always like working on music on his computer. And then, you know, sometimes we would just, you know, sit around in his place and watch. He, he was a huge Rolling Stones fan. He had all these videos of the Rolling Stones. I was a huge Rolling Stones fan. So we would like watch his Rolling Stones videos and, you know, hang out, talk. You know, we were just like we were just became friends. I mean, at yeah. one point he was um, giving my son guitar lessons and I would bring my son over there uh, once a week and uh, we'd be there for for an hour and Jimmy would would to teach him how to play, you know, Satisfaction or, you know, The Last Time or, you know, songs that my son was into that he wanted to know how to play. He was a guy who, you know, before the drugs messed him up, he was a really gracious guy who did things for his friends, you know. Yeah. Um, that was one example of that. What made you decide three years ago you were going to write a book about it? I went on Facebook and there was a post um, in the Mabue Gardens has a Facebook group that I'm a member of. I went there, I always would go there and sort of look to see what was going on. And there was a post someone had done, I think Chester Simpson, photographer that I know, that Jimmy Wilsey died yesterday. This was, this was on Christmas day. And it was like, he died on Christmas Eve day. Yeah. And I just about fell over because he, he was only 61 years old. That is way too young for somebody to die. And so then um, I was expecting just to read an obituary about him in one of the local papers. I, you know, there was nothing in the, in the Bay Area papers. There was nothing in the LA Times. And I mean, he'd been an important guy in the Bay Area. He's been in two important bands. He'd been, yeah. he was key to Wicked Game becoming, Chris Isaac's Wicked Game 
becoming a top 10 hit in 10 countries. I mean, that would not have happened without Jimmy Wilsey. And, yeah. and Chris Isaac, you know, told me, you know, that was absolutely, you know, he totally agrees that that was the case. And it's, you know, I document the whole thing in the book. But anyway, um, there were no obituaries about him. And so I called up um, an editor that I'd stayed in touch with at Rolling Stone. This was, a you know, I was no longer working at Rolling Stone. I'd done a bunch of other things since then. But um, I called up this editor that I knew and said, hey, you got to run a story on Jimmy Wilsey. And the guy said, OK, well, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll go for a story. And so, you know, I wrote a extensive piece. It wasn't just an obituary. It was it's all you can find it online. It's a 2000 word story about Jimmy and why he was important and what happened. And that led to um, me feeling like this guy needs to be remembered. Yeah. This guy was one of the great guitar players. He should be when they make these lists of, you know, the 100 best guitar players. I think he should be in those lists, but he's not in those lists. And so I just felt like, you know, if I write something substantial about him, then um, if some somebody who wants to know about the guy who played that, you know, that Wicked Game riff, which everybody mm -hmm. in the whole world has heard that song, that song streams millions and millions of times yeah, every iconic. month. It, it was streamed 220 million times in the three years that I was working on the book. That's how popular that song is. It's in that, that short list of iconic songs that you can hear two seconds of it and you know that what the song is just because of that guitar part. You know? Yeah. It's like, all, well, you all you need is You hear where, Sweet Child of Mine, Sweet notes. Child of Mine comes in and you immediately know what it is. <laughs> Wicked Game comes in, you immediately know what it is. And, and as a guitar player, it's such a hard thing to make something so simple sound so perfect. Yeah, and, and the thing is that it's not just people who are, who are serious music fans. I mean, you play the beginning of that song to practically anyone. Mm -hmm. And I've done this. I've played people who are, who are really not big music fans. They don't, buy, they, they don't pay attention to what's going on in music, but I, you play it for them and they go, oh yeah, I know that song. Right. So as somebody that knew Jimmy, I have, a, I have a musician question for you. He made a comment in the book about like, I can't play like Mike Campbell. I can't play fast like that. Um, and then he was known as, what was it, the king of slow? Is it the king of slow? Yeah, right. He seemed like an insightful guy, and when he'd sit and practice, I, I just imagine him thinking like, okay, well, I'm not going to be the fast player, so I'm going to perfect this slow thing. I think it was much more organic. I think mm. it was, you know, he, in in high school, he played, you know, with a bunch of his friends, and they, they learned how to play Stone songs and Neil Young songs, and, you know, he became, he was a big Bowie fan, he was, he mm. was, um, a big Patty, he became a Patty Smith fan, a Lou Reed, Velvet Underground, Lou Reed fan, Stooges. He, he dug all that sort of stuff. And he basically tried to figure out how to play the riffs that he, for the songs he liked. And he also thought about, the, he said he, he sort of thought about like with George Harrison, he said, you know, he thought about, you know, why did George Harrison play what he played in these Beatles songs? You know, both on an intuitive level, but also on an analytic level, what makes for, you know, a, a compelling guitar part for a song. And then he got sick, seriously into rockabilly and into the Elvis Sun sessions, <clears throat> right, you know, right before, uh, toward the end of the Avengers, we're talking now, um, you know, early 79, and then when he, he was also always a fan of country music because he'd heard country music around the house when he was growing up. And so, um, you know, when he met Chris Isaac, the two of them really bonded over rockabilly and country music. And they also were really into the early, um, early Beatles, British Invasion stuff. And yeah. so when Chris Isaac started writing songs and Jimmy is like figuring out parts for the songs, this sort of very atmospheric sound he, he developed this this sound and and he said once they worked on the, the first couple of songs and there was kind of this sound that was happening then it just lent itself to all the songs that came after that joel selvin wrote in the san francisco chronicle he called it the willsey sound and he yeah. said jimmy is the sound and chris isaac is the voice and he in the right he writes the songs you know and that was sort of the dynamic between the two guys i don't think jimmy was trying to initially 
was was you like okay well i'm not i can't play fast so this is you know i'm gonna no i mean it was just like this is what he felt lent itself to the song and then as time went on then he was refining and i think that's kind of what happened over the course of his life and so when you listen to his solo album that he did he recorded in 2007 el dorado his playing on that solo album i think is a refinement of you know what he what he was doing earlier on when you decided to start the book where did you begin because you you met him in 82 and he moved to san francisco back in the 70s and, and with the avengers and all that other stuff where did you begin and, and how did you get all the information that you needed to, to gather to make it happen well i i interviewed um over 60 people who were close to jimmy in various ways um but before that i mean i had I had interviewed Chris Isaac over a 10 year period for like more than 10 hours. And I had all those tapes. I had interviewed Jimmy for four hours in the course of uh, two different interviews. And I had that. I'd interviewed Chris Isaac's mother. I'd interviewed Eric Jacobson back in 87. You know, I'd interviewed uh, the other guy. There were two guys, uh, the guy Mark Plummer co managed Silvertone and Isaac. And I interviewed him. So I had a lot of material from back when I was doing all these different articles, you know, during during the 80s into the beginning of the 90s. So I had all that. And so I subsequently knew all those people. I mean, I could get Eric Jacobson on the phone. I could get Mark Plummer on the phone. These were people that were, you know, acquaintances of mine, friends of mine. And um, and so Eric's still alive, too. I, I saw on the Internet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Eric's a great guy. Then there were things like, um, you know, somebody would tell me, um, I mean, Penelope Houston mentioned some of Jimmy's girlfriends. And so then I, you know, I would go online and, you know, and you could, I could find on Facebook, um, you know, Claudia Summers. I think that's how I found Claudia Summers, who was Jimmy's first serious girlfriend. First girl, yeah. You know, and, um, and so I, you know, messaged her and she responded and i said what i was doing could we talk on the phone this was initially for the article i was doing for rolling stone and so you know one person would lead to another i mean you know a guy who um this guy rob georgian rocky um he was jimmy's best friend at junior high school so you know a same thing through facebook i was able to present what i was doing to rocky and and he was like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to talk about Jimmy. Um, yeah. And so, you know, he had done a post about Jimmy after Jimmy died. And so that, that, that was how I found out about him. And he, in turn, told me about some of Jimmy's other friends, put me in touch with some of his other friends. And, you know, it, it just kind of, I mean, over this three and a half year period, that, you know, it's just, that's, that's how it sort of unfolded. I talked, did, I did, you know, talk to over 60, as I said, people during this three-year period but some of those people i talked to over and over and over again over the three years i mean i can't tell you how many hours of conversation i had with eric jacobson it was huge you know and and claudia summers was someone that we exchanged emails for you know three years whenever a a new question would come up that I hadn't asked her before. I could fire that off in the email and she was nice enough to respond. Same yeah. with Penelope Houston, who was the singer in the Avengers. But it was it was an enormous research project. I mean, I had never done anything like this before, but it was um, it was exciting for because, you know, in the level of just the story was unfolding over time as as I talked to more people and and then I had questions that I wanted answered. I mean, one big question was, why did Jimmy become addicted to heroin? And bigger than that, why do certain people become heroin addicts? Yeah. I had I had always thought, well, 
you shoot up heroin a couple of times and you become addicted. But it's much deeper than that. And it, it has to do with things that happen in your childhood. And, you know, Jimmy was clinically depressed. Jimmy's family moved around a lot because it was a military family. It was he was the youngest kid. It was a very strict, you know, his parents were very strict with the kids. Um, and, and there's other factors that, that enter it, into it. Uh, and so that's something that I definitely um, that's a theme that runs through the book is sort of talking about addiction and 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 how addiction happens and and i hope that on one level i hope this book is a cautionary tale for musicians yeah. about what not to do yeah i mean did you have a uh any of those 60 interviews were any of those with his guys that he did do drugs with that like you get a better insight of like how he was living during those years and such well it was more like um people who had gone to i mean like Michael Zagaris, who's um, a quite well-known well -known photographer, he shoots for, for the 49ers and, um, you know, does other sports photography, but he's also, uh, he's, he's a major rock photographer. And, and he was friends with Jimmy and with Chris Isaac, still friends with Chris Isaac. And he lived seven blocks from where Jimmy lived. And so after Jimmy got fired from, um, from working with Chris Isaac, which which happened in um, '92, um, he was showing up at rehearsals and he couldn't remember his parts. And it was, yeah. yeah, it was really terrible. And um, so Chris Isaac got, I mean, he he couldn't get a hold of Jimmy. They, Jimmy wasn't in the band, but um, but he couldn't get a hold of him according to Michael Zagaris. And so Mike he called up Zagaris, and the two of them went to Jimmy's um, storefront apartment, and they're knocking on the door and Zagara said he got down and looked looked through the uh, mail slot and the apartment was just trashed and they're and finally they're knocking on the door they're calling you know Jimmy finally they hear this faint voice like get out of here leave me alone you know it's just and so and Chris Isaac says says to Zagara he says well we got to do something Chris Isaac was very naive about drugs, didn't know anything about drugs. He's never used drugs, um, as far as I know. That's you know, he's never he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke. He's a very straight guy, and that served him very well, um, you know, in terms terms of his career. But he, at the same time, he, he's very naive. So he's like, well, we got to do something. There's got to be something we can do. And Zagaris says, there's nothing we can do. If you know, if this if if this guy, if Jimmy doesn't want to do something about it no one is you can't do anything he said and what no are we going to do he says what are we going to do you're going to check him into like betty ford center or something for are you going to pay for him pay eighteen thousand dollars or whatever it is for him to be there for a month and then what he gets out and then what are you going to do chris i mean you can't you can't do it man it's not it just doesn't work and yeah. so you know so they split uh, a woman who became one of jimmy's girlfriends um was at during that period and a little bit later she w was coming up to san francisco to try to check on jimmy and she would go to his apartment and he would let her in and um she said it was just i mean mail was just piled on the you you know it was like the whole floor was like a sea of of mail and i mean he was so messed up he wasn't depositing checks at that point, we're talking 92, 90. Now we're talking, let's say, 93. He had checks that he could have deposited. At his bank was across the street, literally across the street from where his apartment was. But he wasn't doing that. And so he ended up yeah. getting evicted from that place because he didn't have any money and he wasn't paying his, his bill. But, yeah, he had, was, he, but he had money. He just he, wasn't. He had the money the at that point. Yeah, he, he had the money. He wasn't, wasn't functional wasn't functioning yeah what was their dynamic chris isaac and, and jimmy because on on one hand you said chris uh, chris isaac is, is like a straight laced uh, you know like uh doesn't drink doesn't smoke kind of guy um seemed like he was you said he was green in that area it seemed like he was green in songwriting too whenever he met jimmy did he rely on jimmy at, at, you know at, to sort of hone his songwriting skills well okay i mean when when the when they first met I mean, Jimmy was, I mean, Jimmy had been a big star in mm -hmm. the small punk scene of San Francisco. I mean, the punk scene was, you know, four or five, 600 people at first, you know, but within that 600 people, Jimmy was, was, was at, he was like one of the people at the center of it. So he, yeah. so he was a star 
on that kind of level. And, you know, if you've got hundreds of people that are like fans, you know, 400 people come see the Avengers. In the scheme of the world, that's not a lot of people. Yeah. But just get in, a, a, just go to a, to a place with 400 people and imagine what it would feel like if all those people are your fans. You yeah. know, it's it's like overwhelming. So anyway, he was a big star and he'd written um, the music for the Avengers best known song, a song called We Are The One. Um, it's a really great song. Jimmy wrote the music. Penelope Houston, the singer, told me that he did come up with the music. Most of it. That was the Avengers best known song. So here's a guy who's had a song that I mean, you know, I don't know how many, you know, I don't know, thousands, a couple of thousand records probably had sold at least. That song was released as a as an EP by Danger House. Yeah. So, I mean, he's written a song. He's actually sold records with his song on it. Chris Isaac is a guy that no one's heard of from Stockton, you yeah. know. So, so that was the initial dynamic. Now, Chris Isaac came up to the Bay Area and, um, and he got a, a trio together. And, you know, Rockabilly Trio, and they were playing the Mabue Gardens, and they were becoming popular. So, and then Jimmy ended up, he was out of the Avengers. He, he, they'd broken up. And at first he did construction. And then he decided he was going to do, he wasn't sure if he was going to be an abandoned again, but he, he was going to do whatever he could with music to make a living. And he got asked um, to do sound for Silvertone. And so, and he, and specifically, do you know how to use this, this, uh, Echoplex machine, you know, because we want to put echo on Chris's voice. That's how they, him and Chris bonded because before and after the shows, Jimmy would show him how to play the guitar licks for the rockabilly songs he was playing. Chris yeah. wasn't a very good guitar player at that point. Jimmy was a great guitar player. So Jimmy, Jimmy knew all the, all the, the riffs, you know, he could show them how to do it. They also, because they both like country music, they were bonding over that. And so that's how they got to know each other. Then Chris got sick of his rockabilly band and he broke it up, but he kept working with Jimmy and very quickly they formed a new version of Silvertone, the two of them. Jimmy brought in a guy to do stand-up bass. They brought back the drummer who had been in the previous, you know, version. But it was that that was Chris and Jimmy's group. They were partners in that group initially. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode with Michael Goldberg. We're going to be back next week with part two of the Michael Goldberg interview. It should be really good. I just lost the jewel pod. We'll get another one. But in the meantime, make sure you go like, subscribe, and report like we always do. Send us a DM. Go to whateverbody.com. Whatever it is you want to do. Until next week, we'll see you, and we'll be back with Michael Goldberg. Stay away from those technical difficulties. (laughs) 